I'm Linda van Tolberg for Buzz News. The South African National Space Agency, or SANSA, is going to play an important role to collaborate with NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, in their quest to reintroduce humans to the lunar surface. Construction is about to commence on a communication facility in Mikeysfontein, and we have SANSA's managing director, Raul Hodges, to delve into the details of this collaboration. Hi, Raul, and um, nice to speak to you again. Hi, right, thanks, Linda. So, this is so exciting. Um, t- tell us about this collaboration and what's going to happen now. Well, it's got, a re- it's got quite a long background. Uh, we started in negotiating in 2014 with NASA to find an appropriate site in South Africa to be able to put up such a ground station. <clears throat> when putting up ground stations for specific uses, such as deep space, um, the environment is key, um, and there are a few factors that we needed to put in place uh, in, this, in the search for such a place. First, you need uh, a dry, uh, arid area. You have to be close to an airport, um, relatively, uh, close to a harbor, close to uh, fiber optics and power. And with those, with those key things, we started looking for a site and uh, uh, then we were contracted by NASA in 2019. Um, to find such a such a site, um, and lo and behold, uh, Mikey Fontaine uh, started looking better and better by the day as we did the study, and it came out tops. Um, the reason why you want a, a ground station in the southern hemisphere uh, is to be able to see um, the moon uh, from a northern and a southern hemisphere on a twenty-four hour basis, uh, and that uh, and the arid area of Mikey Fontaine makes it very suitable for such communication to the moon um, for the intended Artemis program. So how long would this construction take? We have very strict deadlines. We are already in the process. We've completed the environmental impact assessment. Uh, We've dotted a lot of the the contracts and and signed many of the contracts. And so, and we've started with uh, some of the prerequisites for the construction, such as uh, the hydrology survey, um, the soil sampling, um, and all, and we're starting to draw up the plans uh, for what the site must look like. We've laid out the site, so we, we're on that process. Our, our deadline uh, is the 20, 2025, so roughly around about March 2025, we want to be very close to completion. Uh, for the Artemis 3 launch. Um, I'm just sort of remind us the, of the Artemis launch and what's going to happen there, because I know they've recently announced astronauts and it would be the first time that somebody of color is going and it would be the first time that a woman is going. What are What is NASA's timelines? Well, Artemis is a, is a, is a worldwide project, collaboration project. Um, and by that, uh, NASA has come up with this project where uh, we, they, they want to go to the moon, put people on the moon, and from the moon, go to Mars. So the, the end product is Mars. Going to the moon, uh, back to the moon, everything we learned in the 60s is still in archives. So all those things come back in, in, into play. Building the rocket, landing on the moon, getting people on the moon, walking on the moon. Um, so NASA's got a... Uh, Artemis program, the first rocket was launched and rendezvoused around the moon and came back. The second one uh, will also go up, rendezvous the moon um, without humans. And the third one will have humans on board, which will land on the moon physically and work on, walk on the moon and come back. So those are the three planned programs for Artemis 1, 2, and 3. So Artemis 1 was, was successful. Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. But re- regarding Artemis, there are many other uh, th- launches that will go to the moon. For equipment, for instance, uh, or probes that are going to go around the moon. Um, so the, the first part also is to create a hub around the moon for communication, such as internet communication, so that the, we can constantly speak to these probes and the humans and stuff on the moon. At the end of the day, they'll probably put people on the moon to stay there for a period of time. And then from there, up, skip and jump to uh, Mars. 
I like your hop, skip and jump. It sort of reminds you of the first astronauts because that's what they looked like when they were on the moon. Um, um, this is exciting for South Africa to be part of this amazing program, isn't it? We must remember that since the African space uh, history started well in the 1958s to 1963, that's where we started. And we were involved at Hattabiasuk where I'm sitting today uh, with the NASA program which brought that technology to South Africa because it was sitting in the Southern Hemisphere. So Australia, South Africa, and uh, South America are, are, are all in the Southern Hemisphere and can, can, can create that, that, those coordinates to, to, to see probes going to the moon. And South Africa already started that technology in 1962 uh, when they built this site. Unfortunately, in 1975, a lot of things went south, and um, they they closed it down to certain uh, funding uh, challenges. However, going back to the moon, it just proves the point. You you still need the location. It's where you put the the, the antenna to communicate with the probes around the moon is key, and that's what makes South Africa uh, key in this project. The technology and the skills sit, still sit with the people. We've managed to maintain those skills in HBK, or Warpiasuk, if I want to say, and build that reputation to what it is today. Um, and that was recognized by NASA. Um, and therefore, the coming back makes it so much easier because we have the, the, the experience, the knowledge, the skills, and the people to train to be able to build another site uh, the same as uh, Hartebiasuk, in Mikey's Fontaine, and it will come over a period of time. I mean, uh, we had this site had three antennas in 1990s. It is now over 70 antennas. So, in the future, I believe Mikey's Fontaine will go the same route and also deal as a backup station for the Artebiasuk station, uh, which will make it even more uh, accessible for the international market. Yeah, and I see there's a lot of even private companies sending up satellites now. So South Africa seems to be at the forefront of, of these developments in space. Yeah, it is it's something that South Africa can be very proud of. Um, they've excelled in the last, so we say, 50 years and kept up with that technology. And um, we, we're not lacking in technology. We're not lacking in equipment um, compared to the the... the when it comes to ground stations uh, and that skill. Uh, so yes, we, we, we can play in that market and um, we can get our fair share if we continue maintaining it. So it's important to continue maintaining it. And, and, and do you have the experts to continue that? We have the skills in South Africa. Um, we just have to, as an organization and as South Africa, um, continue the quality work that we've done in the past uh, and continue with that skills build um, and continue funding it correctly, uh, and it will continue growing. Yes. So, um, so it seems that um, the Karoo is a good place for these stations because what is the clear skies and 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 where it's situated. And if you look at the SKA, it's also there. Yes, if you if you have a look at the Karoo, which is very attractive to uh, certain parts of um, of the space race. I mean, you, the Karoo SKA is a a square kilometer array, which is, 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 plays the part in astronomy. And when you, when you start looking at stars and black holes, and uh, you, you want very quiet um, radio noise. You don't want radio noise because to get the signals back is, is very, um, are very small signals. So you, don't, you want a, a noise-free zone, as we call it, uh, and the same with Mikey's Fontaine. We're dealing with people's lives. We're dealing with spacecraft going to the moon and beyond. You want a quiet uh, zone. You also want an arid area because of the frequencies we use, um, clouds and uh, raindrops and stuff like that interfere uh, the end of the day with your signal. And uh, that's why we're looking for those arid areas such as uh, the Karoo. Well, can you describe us, to us what one of these ground stations look like? Is that similar to what we, you know, sort of used to at Hartbeer's Hook? Yes, it will, it will look much similar to Hartbeer's Hook. It won't be as green though, but um, 
the antennas are normally larger. So we talk about uh, antennas with the, the dish diameter of at least 18, 20, 24, uh, 35 meters uh, parabole. And the reason is the further you go out into space, the smaller the signal gets, the bigger the ears need to be. Um, and, and, and that's the reason. So you will see larger antennas, um, less of them, and uh, they move very slowly. Um, so it will look much like RBS Hook, just with larger aperture antennas. Well, um, good luck, um, Rahul Hodges, with this. And, you know, we hope that, to see this liftoff day where South Africa can sort of proudly track, you know, what's happening with NASA's program putting people on the moon. Yes, we are, We are. Um, we, we, you know, uh, it's a huge project and we are very proud to have this project and to be dealing with NASA. Uh, and to be able to be funded from government. So it's um, it's a proud day for us. What is it like, can I just ask you a personal question, dealing with the Americans? Um, to me, nothing new. Um, I've been dealing with Americans, Europeans, Russians, you, you name it, for the last 30 years. Um, we're doing business with them. Um, and every country has a different way of doing a project. Um, some are much more meticulous, um, some trust and you do it your way. Um, so it is, uh, everybody is a bit different. So, but and that's what makes it uh, exciting. Uh, everybody launches a satellite differently. Um, and every project is new and different. Uh, and that's what keeps you in the job. It's not, it's not, um, monotonous. Well, um, what, what is your answer to people who say, but why are we doing all this when people are, have problems with water, electricity? What is the importance of still exploring outer space? You, you as a country have to go forward, um, no matter at what cost. We, we have to explore the future to be able to bring that technology back to help the challenges on the ground. Um, if we don't go continue exploring the future, we will not have the skills, the people, uh, to be able to fix the challenges that face our community every day. Thank you, Rahul Hodges, for speaking to us. Thank you very much.